Good evening, everyone. My name is Aurelio Maraca. I am the program, technology program coordinator here for the Danbury Library, and we welcome you here for this special evening with Professor Ronald Mallett's top five time travel movies of all time. So um, I would just like to say that um, on behalf of the uh, friends of the Danbury Library, we welcome you uh, to this special presentation. And uh, now I can just go ahead and say, Professor Ronald Mallett, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. And uh, so what I want to do is to start off with the uh, number five of those movies. And I think that that was, if I'm trying to remember, as Time Cop? Yes, Time Cop, which I've sadly to say I've never seen. You know, I'm a Jean-Claude Van Damme fan, but I've never seen it. So for most of us who have never seen this movie, can you just tell us about what the plot is and then, you know, discuss how much, why you like this movie? Okay, well, the, the reason why I like it is because of the fact that when it comes to time travel, and we'll talk about the real scientific possibility of time travel later on. But this movie deals with the ethics of time travel, which is something that I'm asked about frequently whenever I'm giving lectures about it, which is to say that if time travel to the past is possible, then uh, couldn't it be used for nefarious purposes? And the question is, is that yes, that's the reason why just like, for instance, air travel, we have uh, a commission that actually controls air traffic. And we do know that air travel can be used to get us on holidays. It's a wonderful thing to have it. Uh, but also we think of 9-11, we can see the other things that uh, air travel can be used. So time travel to the past is gonna have to be regulated. And what Time Cop does is it does, it actually talks about the possibility of how it might be regulated. And they actually have uh, people who look out for violations because it's forbidden to use the machine to travel to the past. The government has actually uh, forbidden that, even though it is possible to do that. And uh, these cop time cops are actually sort of like um, a time travel version of Interpol. They are able, they have a technology that they can detect when some disturbance in the past has happened. They actually are able to see the ripple of that effect as it's happening before it reaches the present. So, because of the fact that they can see the beginning of that. You might say that when the stone is dropped, they can see the first ripple that comes from it before it spreads out. And so they actually send a time cop back to uh, a time police officer back to that particular point in the past, and they correct it. And they actually give examples of that. Someone who goes back to the, uh, the Wall Street crash and tries to make a mint uh, knowing what's going to happen. And someone trying to go back and change things in the Civil War. The plot of the movie, of course, is based on the fact that you can have someone in the present who's going to use that technology. And I don't want to tell you too much about uh, the plot because it's really interesting to see how it develops. But the reason why I think that the movie is significant is because of the fact that when we do have time travel to the past, we are going to have to have it regulated. I know everyone would like to have their own individual time machine. And because of the fact that it it, uh, every all in fact, the reason why many of us are interested in time travel of the past is because of the fact that there may be something in our past that we would like to correct. For me, in fact, that was a motivator. I mean, I was interested in the possibility of maybe going back to the past and keeping my father from having a heart attack. So that was one of my original motivations. But there could be a larger issue. That is to say that time travel could be used to send information back to the past that warns us of natural disasters and save millions of lives, but it would have to be regulated. So the question is, is how is that going to happen? And as I said, Time Cops is really an excellent example of dealing with that. It was fun just as a, you know, a, a good movie of time travel. And as I say, Claude Van Damme was very good in that movie, but also it does deal with the ethics of time travel. So to me, that is one of the reasons why it's an important film. Excellent. Um, so um, is there anything else that you would like to add in regards to that, uh, you know, to that movie, uh, Time Cop? Is it is it like one of those movies you think is like sort of like what they call a cult movie that, you know, many more people should be watching this film because it has some good merits. Like you said, it actually does have an ethical, uh, you know, rules 
you know, and also I may add that the new series on Disney Plus, Loki, is like that. It has a lot of elements that you described uh, from Time Cop to it. And that sounds like that's a series that I'm going to have to check out because it does sound like it's, it deals with that. But I don't know about it becoming a cult uh, feature, but I do think that it is important because of the fact that it does address that problem. Now, one thing that, well, no, I won't go into because as I said, I, want, I don't want to tell you too much about it because I want people to take, check it out. As I said, it's, it's really a fun movie and it deals with a particular paradox because what happens, and I'm not going to say about what it is, but what happens to the police themselves? Because if they, if, what is the temptation that a time traveling cop might face with something that happens in their past that they might want to correct? How do they deal with that particular dilemma? And I'm not going to let you know how they try to deal with that. Well, wouldn't that be for all time travelers? You know, if they go into the past or into the future, their personal oh, yeah. history, personal lives are going to be international. Oh, yeah. no, they, they're, they're, they're forbidden, of course, but just like anything else. I mean, the, and they, they are good at that. I mean, they have not had any violations of that. But the question is, is that what happens if one of them has faces that kind of a dilemma? And the question is, is that even though it is forbidden, just because something is forbidden doesn't necessarily mean that it's not going to happen. We know that just in everyday life. Yes, I agree. Let's go on to number four. Number four is Interstellar. Uh, so tell us a little bit about Interstellar, sir. Yeah, Interstellar is really one of my favorites because of the fact that uh, it's an exciting movie. And it deals with many, many, many issues besides time travel. One of them is uh, something that we're facing right now, and that is uh, environmental crisis. That is to say, climate control. And in that movie, it actually extrapolates when the Earth is actually facing uh, the fact that it might no longer be habitable. That's actually a premise that's at the beginning of the movie. So I'm not giving uh, that particular part of the movie away. But the, the notion is, is that perhaps we have advanced to the point that we're able to find other habitable planets. Now, that's another important issue because that is something that's part of real science right now. It wasn't until 1990 that scientists really thought, knew that there were other possibility of other planets actually orbiting other suns. We knew that there were stars out there, of course, that, that are suns, but we weren't sure about whether they had planets in the cell. And now we know that they're called extrasolar planets. And that movie takes off on things that are really a part of our present science. And so the movie posits the fact that we have been able to find habitable planets out there. And astrophysicists really do believe that that is a real possibility. So uh, the, how do we get there? And the notion is, is that we could use the notion of a wormhole to get there. And they, they do do that. And what the movie does is it plays with the concept of time. And I don't want to give too much about you know, how they do that, but the physics behind it is very accurate. That's another reason why I think it's great. In Time Cop, what they did was they didn't tell you how time travel occurred. They just showed you some process, okay? And that's made it fun because if you say how uh, it happens then all of a sudden people become scrutinizing that. Well, in Interstellar, they actually tell you about that. They actually tell you that when they travel to near a black hole, a black hole has a strong enough gravity that it can actually alter time. That's part of Einstein's general theory of relativity, that a black hole has gravity and gravity can alter time. And if you get close enough, time will slow down for you. You will not age as much as everyone else near a black hole. And if the black hole is rotating, you could actually use it to go back into the past. So we do know from the theory of black holes, we know that black holes exist, and we know that we have rotating black holes as well as ones that aren't rotating very rapidly. So when we get close to them, they will have time travel effects associated with it. And that's one of the things that happened into the movie is you actually have people going to these distant planets that are near a black hole. And so time is altered for them. And they use that in a very, very dramatic sequence in a number of different ways. So the movie is really great, not only as an adventure showing how we do, may have to deal with climate change by going to other planets, but it also deals with concepts of wormholes, black holes, and these things are anchored in real physics and the way in which they did it 
as well. And I should mention that one of the reasons why they did the physics well is because one of the technical consultants was a man named Kip Thorne. Kip Thorne won the 2017 Nobel Prize uh, for observation of gravity waves. These are waves of space itself that we have been able to detect. This was predicted by Einstein over 100 years ago, but we didn't have the technology to actually discover them until recently, until this century. So Kip Thorne, as I said, he was really someone who understands Einstein's general theory of relativity, and he made sure that the physics that was discussed in the movie was accurate. So I would really recommend it to people just because it is a great adventure story. Uh, it's a great, also I should mention, it's a great father-daughter story. Uh, that is one of the key emotional things that they have in it, is they have this link between uh, the father who's going to do this adventuring and the daughter that he leaves behind. So that, that father-daughter story is really touching and it's a, actually a very important portion of the movie. So on a whole number of levels, I would really highly recommend uh, Interstellar. Thanks, that's, uh, uh, that's something I, I totally agree. Unfortunately, the, the same director of Interstellar did Tenet. <laughs> and Tenet, uh, just, I don't know, maybe Kip wasn't around, maybe he was out yeah, on a they lecture didn't tour. Have, right, they didn't have the technical directors behind that, so that, that's one of the problems. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, so uh, the next, let's move ahead, uh, and the, uh, the third on your list of top five, uh, Professor Mallet, is Back to the Future. I think a few people have seen that before. No, in fact, it's one of the most popular time travel movies of all time, hands down. And it really is a fun movie. It's one of my favorites. I mean, it really is a lot of fun. I mean- uh, But does it hold up to the test of physics? <laughs> no, that is where it differs from Interstellar. Whereas Interstellar has, it does it hands down, it does the physics. It does not do that in uh, Back to the Future, okay? You cannot use a DeLorean, no matter how fast it goes, to go back into the past. Uh, that, that's just not possible. As a matter of fact, I, I should mention that, that there is an effect associated with traveling to the future using speed, but that's not something that will happen with a DeLorean. But this notion of using it to go back to the past just isn't gonna work. For me, it was just simply, one of the things that I think that it dealt with in a very good way is a paradox associated with going back to the past. And that is actually one of the important things that was in the movie, which is the fact that if you can travel back to the past, then, and you alter it, then you may do something that could actually uh, be a problem for yourself. Now, what do I mean by that? There's a, an effect that's called the grandfather paradox. And what it means is that if you travel back to the past and suppose you prevent your grandparents from meeting each other, then they don't have your parents. And if they don't have your parents, your parents don't have you. And if they don't have you, you don't exist. And that was part of what was happening to Marty McFly. When he was going back to the past, his mother was becoming uh, infatuated with him. And that would mean that, he, that she would not get together with his father. And in fact, there is a scene in the movie, uh, and I, I'm not giving away a whole movie by talking about that particular scene in which, uh, his, his mother, his father doesn't seem to be able to connect with his mother in the past, and Marty McFly begins to disappear. Now, whether or not that would be what would really happen, we don't know, but it is a possibility, and it's one of the reasons why, uh, from a philosophical standpoint, people have wondered whether time travel is possible, because you could do something that might erase your own existence. Now, there is actually an alternative to that particular notion, and it has to do with the notion of parallel universes. And what do I mean by that? Quantum mechanics is the two major pillars of physics are relativity and quantum mechanics. Relativity deals with space and time, okay? Quantum mechanics deals with the particles of uh, nature, okay? Our fundamental, uh, the chemistry that we have, all of that is based on quantum mechanics. And the notion that comes up with quantum mechanics is that if you travel back into the past, you may arrive in the past of a parallel universe rather than your own universe. And there you could alter the past of a parallel universe. In other words, you could prevent your uh, grandparents from meeting each other in that universe. But since you weren't born in that universe, it doesn't lead to a problem, okay? You don't exist, but you don't exist in that universe. 
But when you go back to the past, you don't come back to the universe that you came from. So that universe leads to your grandparents meeting each other, having your parents and having you. So that aspect is dealt with in uh, Back to the Future. And I think that that notion about what you might, what might happen is really fun. The other reason why I was attracted to it, besides the fact that it is just simply a fun movie, is the fact that they, they chose of all the years that they chose to go back to, they chose a year that for me is one of the most important in my life. And that is 1955 is the year that they go back to. That happened to be the year that my father died of a massive heart attack. And that was actually the origin of my being interested in time travel. I was only 10 years old when my father died of a heart attack and I was devastated. And the thing is, is that uh, I came across about a year after he died, I came across the book that changed my life. It was The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. And I had the notion that maybe if I could go back to the past, I could see him again and change his life. And that, that the fact that they go back to 1955 really had an emotional impact for me because of that, uh, that particular reason. Incidentally, 1955 also happened to be the year that Einstein died. So it's, it's, it was kind of an interesting, uh, interesting year, but that was another reason for me that the uh, movie had an emotional connection, as well as I said, it just was fun, the way in which they dealt with the concept of time and the paradox of what could happen if you go back into the past. Thank you for sharing uh, some of your uh, uh, personal uh, aspects into why you've gone into um, time travel. And I think you cover that in your, in your book as well. Uh, so uh, once again, thanks. Thank you, Professor Mallard, for sharing uh, um, that uh, portion of your life. Um, we're going to move on to number two on your list, which is one of my personal favorites, Planet of the Apes. Oh, yes. Right. This is actually not the more recent version of Planet of the Apes. This is the, uh, I think it was 1968. Was the original, year, uh, the original uh, version, the original version uh, with Charlton Heston that came out. And in the movie, you remember that these astronauts go out in space and they come back to find that they, they're, they, maybe they, they're not sure. They may be on the Earth, uh, but they may be. It's, it's hard to tell because the planet is dominated by apes, and uh, they're wondering what has happened in the interim that they, when they left. And you don't find out until later that what happened is, is that they had traveled out in space so fast in the rocket that time slowed down for them. It didn't slow down for the earth, but it, it slowed down for them because they were traveling so fast and that they had actually arrived in the earth's distant future. So they were only, they, they in fact had been in uh, hibernation, but when they came out, they actually were just as almost as young as they had been when they left but the earth had been decades had passed here on the earth. Now, the question is, is that, uh, of course, the movie then dealt with uh, what the earth would be like if it had been dominated by apes. But the scientific point that they had in it was completely spot on. That was one of the most accurate of the movies with the exception of Interstellar dealing with the concept of time. And I wanna emphasize that because a lot of people real wonder is time travel really scientifically possible and has it been proven in any way? And yes, that is one aspect that it has. We have been able to travel to the future and it's based on Einstein's theories of relativity. It's important to realize that Einstein had developed two theories of relativity. One was called the special theory of relativity, which was developed in 1905 by Einstein. And to put that theory in a nutshell, Einstein said that time for a moving clock slows down. What he meant by that was the faster a clock moves, the more time slows down. Now, your heart is a clock. This would mean that if you were traveling fast enough, your heart rate, your metabolism would slow down. Now, what's important here is that you wouldn't notice it. It's just like when you're in your car going down the highway at 60 miles an hour, you don't feel that, but people see you zooming by, okay? The same thing would happen here. If you were traveling in a rocket that was traveling fast enough, People who were watching you would see your heart rate metabolism slow down. They would see you not aging as rapidly as everyone here else here on the earth. Now, you might say, has that ever been demonstrated? 
not only has it been demonstrated, it's been demonstrated in another of dramatic ways. One is in a device that's called the Large Hadron Collider. This is a, a device that speeds up subatomic particles close to the speed of light. What Einstein said is that the closer you get to the speed of light, the more time slows down. Now, some of these elementary particles only live for mere fractions of a second and completely disappear, okay? Well, what they find is that when they speed these particles up close to the speed of light, their internal clock slows down. They can actually get these particles to live 10, 20, 30 times longer than they normally would if they were standing still. This means that if this was happening with human beings and we were traveling in rockets that were close to, close to the speed of light, we, an astronaut could be out in space for them, maybe only a few years could pass, but when they got back here on the Earth, decades could actually pass. They could arrive in the Earth's distant future. And if they have a family back here on the Earth, they could actually find that whenever they get to the distant future, that their grandchildren are actually older than they are. Now, it sounds weird, but we actually have seen it on a large scale level. And I don't another experiment, which the public isn't aware of, was done in 1970 at the Naval Observatory, it was actually 72. What they did was they took two atomic clocks, which you know are the most precise timekeeping mechanisms that we have. They kept one of the atomic clocks at rest at the Naval Observatory. They put the other clock on an ordinary passenger jet and they flew the passenger jet around the world at the speed of sound. When they brought the passenger jet back, they found that the clock on the passenger jet had actually slowed down compared to the clock that had been at rest. Now you might say, well, gee, how come this wasn't in the New York Times? Well, the effect was there, but remember I said that the plane was only traveling at the speed of sound. This time dilation effect, that's the technical name for the slowing down of time with speed. That happens, it changes depending on the speed that you're traveling at. Even though the speed of sound is fast, something roughly about 740 miles per hour, okay? The speed of light is so much faster, 186,000 miles per second. Now, sometimes it's hard to put these numbers in perspective, okay? Uh, but let me see if I can do that. The speed of sound is actually measured in terms of what are known as Mach numbers, okay? So Mach 1 is one times the speed of sound. Mach 2 is two times, so on. We have passenger jets that can do Mach 1. We have fighter jets that can do Mach 2. Okay, we have stealth fighters that can actually do Mach 3, okay? However, if we translate the speed of light into Mach numbers, it turns out that light travels at Mach a million. In other words, relative to light, sound is practically standing still. So this effect wasn't as dramatic, but once we have rockets, and NASA actually is trying to develop rockets that eventually can go close to the speed of light. They have exotic names like ion engines and things like that. When that happens, this effect that I was talking about of astronauts traveling into space and coming back and finding out that uh, decades have passed here on the earth, that really will happen. And will lead to some interesting sociological implications when that does occur. So the thing is, is that notion in the movie that these astronauts had actually traveled into the Earth's future because of the fact that they had been traveling close to the speed of light, that was completely accurate. And as I said, we've seen the baby steps of that with the experiment that was done at the Naval Observatory, and we send subatomic particles into the future routinely in devices like the Large Hadron Collider. So that really is a very uh, accurate representation. However, no matter how fast you go, you cannot go back into the past. So the movie doesn't deal with that. Uh, Interstellar does, and I'll give you a hint on that. It has to do with the gravity associated with black holes, but that uh, you cannot do it with speed. You know what? Have you ever seen the third of the, the original Planet of the Apes movies? There was Planet of the Apes beneath the Planet of the Apes, and then there was the third called Escape from the Planet of the Apes. Now, that movie dealt with um, the, the two main uh, chimp characters, uh, Cornelius and his wife, and then a third um, uh, chimp. They actually take the original spaceship 
that Charlton Heston came in with the other astronauts from the original movie, and they go back towards the original coordinates. So they go back in time to 1973, um, uh, uh, Earth. Right. And they go back there, and they're shocked to see that the humans rule the planet. So they remain silent, and um, they get put into a zoo because the people don't know what to do, you know, what to do with them. But they can tell that they're highly intelligent. And uh, one of them, uh, the, the third uh, ape, gets killed accidentally at the zoo by another ape, and the other two finally talk. And they become like these celebrities on Earth that these, these are talk, talking apes. And uh, during an interview, I think from the CIA and other scientists, they find out more information from the future. And the humans get scared because they're afraid that if these two apes were to breed, then they will have a child that will also talk. And that will cause the future to be altered in a way to where the uh the future to where uh the planet of the apes happens it will become set and uh that would becomes like a sort of a, a paradox what do we do uh so the humans decide to uh kill the apes kind of like uh and and the, the apes like run away and they and the, the, they both die the, the the mom and the dad but the, the child survives in a circus and he becomes kind of like a Christ figure. And in the subsequent movies, he becomes like a, a Moses type figure. And he uh, brings the apes, uh, you know, to, to, to rule the earth. <laughs> no, I hadn't, the I, hadn't, I hadn't seen that. I mean, the thing is, is that I think there was a version of the, of the origin that had to do with the, an experiment that was being done to enhance the intelligence of apes. It was in the uh, the the remake versions, Rise yeah, of the Planet yeah. of the Apes, the ones that were done the last right. Yeah, I, actually, years. to me, that one has more validity than the than than the version that you're mentioning because the number one, they, I I didn't see the version that you're talking about, but the problem is is how do they get back to the past with the rocket? Because as I said, no matter how fast you go, you can't travel back to the past. You can use speed to travel to the future but you can't use speed to travel the past so unless they were able to somehow say that they were finding a, a time warp or something like that uh which that time warp happened to be at that particular location that they were talking about uh, uh that might be one way in which they did it but it would be a contradiction of the way in which it was done in the first movie which was to simply say that it was actually the speed of the rocket that allowed them to go to the future so as I said, since I hadn't seen that movie, uh, but if, if they, if so, if they were hinting that it was somehow speed that they were able to reverse time, that wouldn't be work, that wouldn't work. Uh, if they were talking about the possibility of somehow there being a time warp out there that they found, uh, that would be a possibility, but then they would have to uh, have that somehow have worked within the first movie. So I'd have to take a look at it, but as I said, that would be a problem. So, so, but to me, the, the remake uh, version would, um, that to me would be much more of a possibility because the fact is, is that uh, we do know that scientists are trying to alter, you know, our genetics. And one of those things that they're trying to alter is the fact that perhaps they can make us more intelligent. And the fact that they might try to do that with apes seems like that would be something that we as human beings should do, even if we shouldn't, uh, simply because of the fact that we have the ability to do it. That's the other thing that's a strength and weakness of the human race, which is to say that we're adventurers and being adventurers is a good thing. You know, That's the reason why we have all the great marvels that we have, but sometimes we can adventure without you know, necessarily uh, doing it in a wise way and it could lead to consequences which we, did, uh, we don't want. But um, as I said, that's so that's interesting, though, that they they talk that, that they use that notion of going back to the past. I think it was for uh, budgetary concerns. <laughs> 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 they didn't want to build the sets anymore, but they wanted to get, they had the uh, the costumes and they're like, hey, you know, this is the set in 1973 uh, United States. And they that's what they did. <laughs> <laughs> so let's move on to the number one. 
uh, at the top of your list, uh, Professor Mallet, and it is the Time Machine, the classic yes. original H.G. Wells, George Powell production. Yes, yes, that is for me, uh, and also for a number of different reasons. I should say that Wells was, was smart in not saying exactly how the time machine worked because he could deal with the concept of time and the, time, uh, the notion of traveling to the future without having to deal with just exactly how this mechanism was going to work. But for me personally, as I mentioned you know, earlier uh, in connection with Back to the Future, one of the things that, that actually, the reason why I am a theoretical physicist and I'm uh, you know, now a professor emeritus because that is rooted in his book because when my father died, and as I said, my father was the center of my life, I should mention. I was the oldest of four children and uh, I was raised in the Bronx, New York, and he was a television repairman. And he looked very healthy, by the way. So when he died of a heart attack, it really threw my world apart. I mean, it just, it crushed me. Uh, and then the next year, as I said, I came across the Classics Illustrated version of that. In fact, I think I have the copy of it here. Yes. Here we go. This is it. You know, this this, oh, is, wow. this is the magazine that changed my life. Okay. And one of the things in it, and I don't know, I mean, as I said, I was 11, but somehow just the cover of it spoke to me. But when I read the page inside, that's when everything turned around for me. Because what it said here, it said, scientific people know very well that time is just a kind of space and we can move forward and backward in time just as we can in space. So when I read this as an 11 year, I thought, wow, they're saying that it's possible to go back in time. And that was my inspiration. I thought if I could go back in time, then I could tell my father what was going to happen and maybe save his life. And so that actually became a mission for me. It became a secret mission. I should mention this was in the 50s. This was before Sputnik. So people were not as open to science fiction as they are today. You know, this, this was in the uh, pre-Star Trek period, which I think of as being, you know, the pre-Star Trek period is like, you know, uh, the, let's say uh, antediluvian. This is, this is the distant past compared to, the, to what happened <laughs> after, after Star Trek. So people have a hard time understanding the fact that, that uh, people were not very receptive about science fiction notions back in the 50s. And as a matter of fact, the fact that I was interested in uh, science fiction was something, or any kid who was interested in science fiction back at that time, they were considered suspect. So uh, things have, have changed. So I kept it as a secret, but, and I even tried to put together something that would uh, look like the magazine. I used bicycle parts and everything else in my old father's old radio television part. Of course it didn't work, but the second thing that changed was but when I was 12, I came across the second book that changed my life. It was called The Universe and Dr. Einstein. And it had a picture of Einstein on the cover next to an hourglass. And as I mentioned, Einstein had died in the same year my father did. In fact, just a year, a month apart from each other. My father died in May. Einstein had died in April of 55. But in any case, since I knew, I didn't know what Einstein did, but I knew he was this great genius. And here he was standing next to an hourglass. So I knew that that must say that Einstein had something to say about time. So I got the pop, it was a popularization and it was hard going, but I did pick up the essence. It said that Einstein said, there are ways in which you can alter time. Unlike the old physics of Newton, where nothing can alter time, you can alter time. And so I decided to dedicate my life to finding out what Einstein had to say. And that led to an interesting long adventure. I should mention after my father died, we plunged into poverty. So I knew I was gonna have to go to college after high school, I had to go into the military and save the money uh, using the, and using the GI Bill eventually. And, but I, and I won't be able to go into all the details, but I had written a um, book that uh, called Time Traveler. And the book is actually a science book, popular science book and an autobiography. And people who are interested, I talk about in very much more detail about how time travel is possible using wormholes, cosmic strings, uh, black holes, uh, all of that. And I also talk about my personal journey, uh, which uh, it, was, it was an interesting journey. And the thing is, is that it, it talks about my breakthrough in actually using Einstein's theory 
of gravity, which is called the general theory of relativity. And I've actually was able to solve his equations, Einstein's equations for gravity for a device that's called a ring laser, which is just simply a, a laser beam that moves around and around in a loop. And I was able to show that you could twist time into a loop, space and time into a loop, which could allow you to go back to the past. And I should mention that I've been pleased with the book has gotten some interest by Hollywood, by the way. Uh, Spike Lee was interested in making a feature film of the book at one time. And uh, now it's uh, being considered by other people, which my uh, film agent says I shouldn't be spe specific about that until we've made a deal. But in any case, uh, <laughs> you uh, got that right. Yeah, don't yeah. don't jinx yourself too. <laughs> right. But another another uh, movie that isn't a Hollywood feature film, but it is something that I think is uh, very much worth seeing is a documentary that I was involved in. Uh, the documentary, and in fact, the poster over my shoulder. Uh, was associated with the documentary. The documentary is How to Build a Time Machine. And it uh, was a documentary that just came out in 2016. It actually won a, an award uh, in 2017 at the New York Science Fiction Film Festival in, in New York. And the movie features me uh, and a man named Rob Niosi and Don Coleman are, are featured in it as well. The, the, the movie is actually a parallel story about myself and, uh, and Rob. And uh, it talks about how the time machine, uh, H.G. Wells' time machine inspired both of us. In my case, it happened to be as a scientist. In his case, it happened to be as special effects. But it, I, it's a very, very entertaining movie. And it is a, that's something that uh, people can see on Amazon Prime, as a matter of fact. It's available. But uh, it is an excellent uh, documentary, and I'm very proud of it. Uh, the thing is, is that, uh, as I said, this notion of time travel into the past is really possible. And Einstein's theory of gravity is what leads to that possibility. Remember I said that using speed, no matter how fast you go, you cannot go back into the past. But according to uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity, which he developed 10 years after the special theory, and the reason why he developed it is that he wanted to make sure that, his, uh, that gravity fit into his original theory According to Newton, I should mention, uh, time cannot be altered by anything. So Newton's theory was already uh, had a problem with Einstein's special theory of relativity. Einstein said that there's an additional problem because gravity can affect time too. What Einstein said is the, strong, the stronger gravity is, the more time will slow down. What he meant by that is that a clock here at the surface of the earth because gravity is stronger, is actually running slower than clocks at high altitudes. Those are actually running faster because gravity is weak out there. Now you might say, has that been shown that time is affected by gravity? Not only has it been shown, but people don't realize it's a part of their everyday life. The GPS system works because of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Let me point out, when they were first setting up the system, the way the GPS system works is that there's satellites above the earth that at a certain time, send a signal that reaches your unit. Your unit has a clock in it. So it receives that signal being sent by the satellites at a certain time. If you know the time the signal was sent and the time it was received, and you know the speed of the signal, which is the speed of light, it, you can compute distance. That's how the system works. You know time, you know speed, you can compute distance. But when they were first setting it up, they were actually supposing that time, that gravity followed Newton's laws, which says that nothing can affect time. So they were assuming that it didn't matter that the clocks in the satellites were way above the earth and the clocks in your unit were close to the ground. But it turns out that in Einstein's theory, uh, your clock in your unit is actually running slower than the clocks on board those satellites. So when they first set up the system using Newton, it was giving wrong, it was giving locations all over the place. But whenever they consulted the physicists, the engineers, they realized that they have to use Einstein's theory of gravity, which says that gravity affects time. So every time you use your GPS system, you should give a nod to Einstein because without his, his theory of gravity, we wouldn't have the kind of system that we have. So that shows that time is affected by gravity. It turns out that if you have gravity associated with a rotating object, like a rotating black hole, 
not only can you cause gravity to slow down, but you can actually cause, gravity can actually cause time to become twisted. Now, the way to think about that is the fact that in Einstein's theory, space and time are connected to each other. And let's suppose you had a, a strip of paper, okay? In fact, if I can probably illustrate time travel to you here. Let me see if I can do this. Let's, let me get a piece of paper here. You can also use a uh, tissue if that works. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, 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 sometimes what I, what I would do to, is that uh, to show how much you know, I liked it, I would actually tell people, uh, I'm gonna use the notes from the last faculty meeting, <laughs> which shows what I thought of faculty meeting notes, which thought what shows what I thought of faculty meetings. But in any case, on this strip of paper, I'm gonna draw a straight line. At the bottom of the line, I'm gonna put the past. At the middle of the line, I'm gonna put the present. And at the top of the line, I'm going to put the future. This is what we would call in physics a timeline. All of us live along this timeline. This represents our whole life. I mean, this is the past, this is the present, this is the future. We're unconscious of this, of course, but we're all carried along this river of time from the past, present, to the future. However, what Einstein's general theory of relativity shows is that you can use the you can use gravity to actually, if you have gravity for a rotating system, or in the work that I did, if you have it for a circulating beam of light, you can actually cause time to get twisted into a loop. This can be shown mathematically. And that's what I was able to show also. So let's see what happens if I twist gravity. So that gravity twists time into a loop. Now, here we are at the past, okay? I continue along this loop in time to the present. I continue along this loop in time to the future, but I've made time into a loop so I can go from the future to where? The past. So by twisting time into a loop, I can travel from the past to the future, okay? So that's what Einstein's general theory of relativity allows for the possibility of having rotating gravitational field created in some way by either a rotating black hole, or as I said, in my case, using a circulating beam of laser light, we might be able to create loops in time. And along those loops in time, we could actually travel back into the past. So whereas the special theory of relativity doesn't allow travel to the past, only travel to the future, Einstein's general theory of relativity allows for travel to the past and the future. So if we were able to find a rotating black hole, we might be able to travel back to the past. And that's one of the things that in the interstellar, you know, this notion of being able to travel back into the past is played with. And as I said, but it is anchored in solid physics. And as I said, what I was able to do was to solve Einstein's gravitational field equations for a circulating beam of laser light. And I was able to show that mathematically. Now, I'm a theoretical physicist. What Einstein was a theoretical physicist. What I did was I was able to come up with the equations, okay? I should mention that, Einstein, that in physics, there's a very, very uh, the great division of labor between theoretical and experimental physics, okay? Uh, theoretical physicists use equations to try to explain how nature works. Experimental physicists use equipment to see how nature actually works, okay? So uh, my theory hasn't been tested experimentally because of the fact that you need equipment. And what people don't realize is how expensive scientific equipment is, because they'll say, gee, you know, Malik, when is this gonna happen? And what I tell people is like anything else, when uh, we're willing to pay for it. Uh, just to give you an example, the, uh, the Nobel Prize, as I was mentioned, was won in 2017 for an experiment in which Einstein had predicted if you have two black holes colliding with each other, it will cause ripples of space itself. These ripples of space are, are called gravity waves. Now, you may say, how expensive is that going to be? 
Well, it turns out that the experiment was for, done over a 10 year period and it cost $1 billion, $100 million. Okay, so scientific experiments are expensive. And that's one of the reasons why, even though in my work, the equations are there, uh, the experiments haven't yet been done. Um, but hopefully sometime in the future, uh, no pun intended, that will happen, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But in any case, so, but the time machine, as I said, for me, the, in the movie, I really recommend that people haven't seen the, there, there was a later version of the time machine that was done in uh, the beginning of this century. It, it, let me just simply say that the version people should see is the original 1960 version because it was done with the actor named Rod uh, Taylor and it is superb. Not only did he do an excellent job, but it, it does, it's accurate to uh, his book, The Time Machine, but it also talks about time as the fourth dimension. I should mention, this is really interesting because in H.G. Wells' book, which was published in 1895, he actually is the first to explicitly state time as the fourth dimension. Scientifically, that didn't happen until 10 years later with Einstein's theory of relativity, where they actually now use the term time as the fourth dimension, okay? So it was very prescient. H.G. Uh, Wells was way ahead by calling time the fourth dimension. That's another reason why that book is so great. And, and, it, and it's a great adventure too. The whole book is done beautifully and the movie is done beautifully. And as I said, Rob and myself were both inspired by it. And if people haven't had an opportunity to see it, I really would say that it, because it is a beautifully done movie and uh, it's it's something worth seeing. It's a great movie. I loved it as a kid. And it's, uh, you know, I remember the Morlocks just scared yes, the yes. heck out of me. <laughs> but again, uh, going back to the um, actual time machine, it, it may, you may have figured it out that the Wells' time machine, especially in the movie, maybe it was powered by some sort of gravity because it never moves. It doesn't use speed. Well, that's, that's right. That's, that's another important point. That's, that actually is a very, people wonder if, if the device and the device that I'm you know, positing based on the equations would actually stay in the same spot, okay? Uh, even though the earth is moving through space, the way the mechanism itself would stay anchored wherever the earth happened to be. So it wouldn't be that he would find himself out in space. He would actually have to move his machine to a different location in order to come out in a different location, but it wouldn't automatically come out in a different location because the earth is moving. So you're right, that's another accurate aspect that's associated with it is the fact that the device would be stationary. So wherever he arrived in the future, it would be at the location, but it would be at the location in the distant future. It actually had some beautiful special effects associated with that as well. So that I think is, uh, I really would recommend that to people. Excellent, thank you. Uh, so we have a few minutes left. So um, if anyone has any questions in terms of movies or, you know, astrophysics to either myself or uh, Professor Mallet, please, Put it in the chat and I will relate it to right. him, uh, you know, because we can go. I know uh, Professor Mal and I can go on and on talking about uh, movies and and time travel and physics. It's just, uh, you know, uh, we, we can talk hours. <laughs> about and, and I should mention that the, the five that that were I chose were actually those are five of my favorites, but they're not all of my favorites, okay? There are many, many movies that time travel movies, and I know that people who are listening to this have their own favorites. So, it, so mine doesn't exclude yours. Those are just the, the five that I thought about as being the top ones. But for instance, I could have mentioned Looper. Uh, I could have mentioned, uh, let's see, it was, uh, one in fact that was recently came up was that was very recent, it was called uh, the Forever War. And it's just been coming out just out recently. And it's a really interesting one. Did you watch that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I found it to be a little, little silly. <laughs> well, the thing is, it was silly in the sense that, that it was, it, to me, what was the interesting adventure was the fact that it showed what, how they resolved it, which was 
I'm not going to say how they resolved the, the yep, problem yep, that yep. occurred with, with it, but it was a great adventure movie. Oh, it's not it's not one of my favorites, but what I'm saying is it's actually a, it's a great it's an exciting uh, adventure. It it's a fun popcorn movie dealing exactly. with with, it, with time exactly. travel. You know, you don't have to be like, oh, you know what? Does this really work in real life? And that's one thing I wanted to ask you. The other, other there was always a debate. It's school with me and my friends. It's either, you know, uh, in, in regards to time travel, it's like, what rules apply? Is it back to the future rules or Terminator rules? So this is my chance to ask you, that's, which, that's, which one applies in physics? <laughs> yeah, in fact, Terminator is another really exciting movie. And, it's, and the thing is, is that once again, it deals with uh, time travel back to the past, okay? And the, the actually the uh, Terminator would be closer than Back to the Future. I mean, the thing is, is that uh, you know, you know, it deals with the grandfather paradox. Right, it deals with the grandfather paradox in a very, very exciting way. In fact, all of them were associated in some way with the notion of the grandfather paradox and about how uh, uh, trying to come back to the past to correct things. So that they wouldn't lead to the, you know, and the, what's the interesting thing is, is that what's different about Terminator, which is uh, from Back to the Future, is the fact that you actually had two protagonists that are involved. You have someone coming back to the past, and then you have the villain and the hero are traveling back to the past. So they interfere with each other in a wholly different way. Okay, although in the first movie, it was the mother that was the the, uh, the Terminator was coming back to try to eliminate. Uh, in the later ones, uh, you actually had uh, the hero coming back as well as the uh, the villain. So it, it really really feels exciting way with the uh, the whole notion of what would happen if you could travel back into the past. And then you actually change the future. So then you're kind of like, you know, they, I, I know in Terminator 2, they're kind of like, oh, now the, the future is sort of altered. So we don't know what's going to happen now, you right, know? Right, right. Another one that is, um, I think that really is very different from all of the other ones is uh, it's called Under the Shadow of the Moon. I don't know if you've seen that one. It's I haven't. I haven't it's seen on, that. One. It's on. It's on Netflix, and all I want to say about it is the fact that it turns the notion of the grandfather paradox on its head. If I even say too much about it, I will give too much about it away. And you, once you see the movie, you realize, whoa, this is really a weird way in which you're dealing with the grandfather paradox. But it's under the shadow of the moon. And uh, as I said, it's available on Netflix. It really is an intriguing time travel story. And it's really worth checking out. Definitely. And I, uh, I know you have other uh, favorite films, and I do as well. You know, we've oh, yeah. uh, both spoken about. Deja Vu movie. is another De one. Deja Vu, Frequency. A frequency uh, is another excellent one. And um, uh, let's see what else uh, that we talked about. I did mention to you that movie La Jatie. It's a, um, a French film made by an American. Uh, it's all, it's a 30 minute movie. You can watch it on YouTube. It's free. They actually remade it as, uh, as the movie 12 Monkeys starring Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt back in the mid nineties. Yeah. And that's another very interesting time travel it film. It is, it is, you know, and so Bruce Willis was in uh, uh, Looper as well which is interesting. You know, those are two major time travel movies that he's been involved in. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, we do have, uh, we have a, a question. Uh, Dr. Mella, do you offer opportunities for summer research? <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to say that I do, but right now, of course, with COVID, that is impossible. But no, I, I don't, I'm not, one of the things is, is that, uh, you notice I said I was professor emeritus. What that means is, is that I've retired from teaching I still do research. I'm still doing active research, but I'm not teaching any longer. After 38 years of uh, classroom teaching, I figured that uh, I and the students had had enough. Even though I've enjoyed it, I love teaching, but I decided that it was time to, uh, to step back and to actually just concentrate on my research and giving popular lectures. And in fact, in the spring, I should be mentioning 
because of my host here, but in the spring of 2022, I plan to give a, a, a talk at uh, the Danbury Public Library. It would be amazing for you. We will welcome you with open arms and hopefully by that time, things will be a lot better than they are now. <laughs> and uh, is there anything else, uh, anyone, uh, we have like just one minute left. I, I know there's a few uh, questions that we have from our audience. Unfortunately, we will not be able to get to them, but um, you know, uh, Professor Mallet, is there anything else that you would like to say to all of us here? No, I mean, just in general though, I mean, you know, even though time travel will be scientifically possible, both into the past and the future. And as I said, we've already been doing it, uh, short steps into the future, what we still have to take ourselves, remind ourselves, especially in these times, is that all that we, all of us really have is the present moment. And so what's important is to live that time that you have now to the fullest, okay, with gentleness towards your fellow human beings. That's all I have to say about that. Thank you, sir. Thank you for spending, sharing, and you know, contributing uh, to all of us here for this uh, one hour. We, uh, we thank you so much, Professor Mallet. And, uh, and to everyone, I bid you good night and we will have Professor Mallet here with us in person soon. Good night, everyone.